Good to see you all, everybody, again. Um, so it's 4th of July weekend. Everyone's kind of coming in here with that real high energy that comes from the 4th of July weekend. All of our campers are well-rested and, you know, chipper and bushy-tailed and ready to, ready to worship fully and expect a very engaged audience today, um, especially because we're talking about your favorite thing on 4th of July weekend, which is the presence of God in covenants, new and old. So... You know, you're all like, oh, yes, I love this passage of Hebrews. Everyone except, including Deb, is super excited about <laughs> Hebrews. Why Hebrews today? Well, we're in a series this summer called Following Jesus. Uh, if you haven't been with us in a while, you may be wondering why the heck we don't have the blockers on the windows. And the heart behind this series is to shake things up over the summer and to bring back to basics our, our faith in, as followers of Jesus in this church. To ask the question, what does, it, what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to follow Jesus with our whole life? We've talked about everything from salvation to, last week Joel talked about repentance, we talked about what growth looks like. And today I want to talk about the presence of God. Now, I'm not an expert on this topic by any stretch of the imagination, but as I mature in my faith, I'm, I'm, I'm growing discontented with a faith uh, that overlooks or perhaps assumes in an unhealthy way the presence of God in my life, in my experience, in my walk with Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? I'll start at the beginning. God's intention was to dwell with his people from the beginning. God's intention was to dwell with the men and the women that he created from the beginning. This was the design of the Garden of Eden. And we have to think about that word design because it was, it was built into the framework. What was built into the framework of creation was that God would not just create but would dwell. And that we as created beings in his image, men and women both, would not just be created beings of dust wandering around on the earth but would actually be fully living as we live in relationship with this God. It's all connected. It's all part of what God intentionally designed. You and I were made for relationship with God. You were not made to live life without relationship with God. That's why so many of us feel so empty before we come to God. And even when we're walking with God, the seasons where we wander away or are not aware of his presence or are living as if he is not a living God find those seasons to be more shallow. It's not that it's always perfect and great and bubble gum and rainbows when we're walking with God, but his presence is felt and is there. It's promised even when we don't feel it. It is there. You and I were made for relationship with God. It's part of the design. The very famous, oft-quoted Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it very famously that says, what's, what's the point of man? What's the point of us be existing on this earth? And they put it very succinctly by saying it's to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify God, yes, check, dutiful, but also to enjoy him forever. Then years, years, years later, pastor and theologian John Piper wrote the famous tome, Desiring God, and in this famous introduction, he says, I'd like to amend it by, by doing this. I'd, he, like, he likes to write it this way. Our end is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. This glory and enjoyment are always linked. This glory and enjoyment are always linked by this presence that you were designed to enjoy and to experience. So it's clear that in the original in design that, that we were given not just license but permission in the original design to dwell with God. That wouldn't just be theoretical or theological, but that was to be the experience. And the question then comes, what, what happened? Now, we all know the Bible answer, sin. I'm going to talk about that. But if we're going to talk about presence, if we're going to talk about living in light of who God is and what he's done, if we're going to walk, talk about living as if God is alive and with us, then we have to talk about what happened when Jesus came and why it matters in this specific part of our faith. 
sin ruined this original design and communion. That may seem like an obvious statement, but let me, let me talk about it a little further and use Hebrews as a help to that. In the garden, as I said, we were created for union with God. This was always his intention. And Adam and Eve were deceived, but they were also willfully ignorant of what God had asked them not to do. They were accountable for what they did, Adam first and then Eve. And so this sin, this rebellion, fractured that relationship with God. Sin and rebellion always fractures relationships, whether it's between you and me or you and a parent, you and a son, you and a coworker. It doesn't matter the, the dynamic or the context. Sin, rebellion, selfishness, ignoring always fractures relationships. It always does. And so why would it be any different with, with God? And this is what happened in the garden. This is all very basic Christian understanding of what's happening. God was created for relationship with these people in this world that he created. Their rebellion fractured that relationship and thereby sin entered not just humanity but also the world and fractured the world and the design with which God designed everything to work was immediately broken because God could not dwell with, the sinful, with these people that have rebelled against him. He could not be present with them in the same way that he once was. There was a fracture there. And his desire was to, to go back to, to, to what things were when things were created, but, but there was a plan that was working out slowly over time, and in the meantime, we were stuck with this in-between. People needing a God to commune with and a God longing to commune with his people, but sin is in the middle of all of that. Rebellion is in the middle of all of that. And so what does God do? God is not just... God is a just God. God is a holy God. He can't just sweep sin and rebellion under the rug, but he offers grace. And early on in the story of God's people, what this grace looks like is law and covenants given and reiterated to articulate to his people that he is there with them, that he does love them, that he is there for him, but, but his presence is going to have to be mitigated and dealt with in a particular and holy way because he is God. And so that's where we get this first portion of this chapter of Hebrews. I'm going to read it again just for reiteration. Everyone ready? This is what he says. This is what the author of Hebrews says. He says that first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. So the author is freely admitting, putting the cards on the table, saying that God made a covenant with his people, that he would still be their God and they would still be his people, but this relationship was strained from what it was in the garden. Can we agree with that? And that's why we have the Old Testament laws, covenants, all of these things. I'm build some, building to something. Stick with me, people. I'm doing something here. So, he's saying that this is what worship looked like here on earth. He's, and he gives some details. There are two rooms in the tabernacle. So the tabernacle is the place where God's presence dwelt. But it was away from the people. And it explains here in what way it was away from the people. He says the first room, there were these two rooms. The first room, there was a lampstand, a table, sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain... And behind the curtain was the second room, called the Most Holy Place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark were a gold jar containing manna, that alludes all the way back to the Old Testament, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. So, like real MVP stuff being held in the, in the Ark here. This is the... Highlight reels of God's people all being held on display. For, above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover which was the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail. And I love this. He's like, there's a lot there. We're just going to keep moving on because I'm making a point. I'm also making a point, so we're just going to move on. When these things were all in place, when everything was set just so, all of this ornate symbolism and presence, the priests regularly entered that first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest, the most holy, the most consecrated, the most set apart of the priests 
entered the most holy place and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins that the people had committed in ignorance. And by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. I'm exhausted reading that. Are you exhausted listening to that? That's kind of the point. Now, there's a tension here, to be sure. And I want to hold it respectfully without just skipping forward. So number one is all of this, just like the author of Hebrews, I don't have time to get into it all right now. Um, But if you know your Old Testament, you know everything mentioned here has symbolism and importance. It's all pointing to God. It's not just like they like fancy things that are old school and ancient. That's not, the, that's not the deal. It all has place. It all has purpose in the story that God is unwinding and writing with his people. But also, it is quite a to-do to get to the presence of God. And that's, that is intentionally clear in a passage like this. So two things can be true at once. We can see the reverence, we can see the awe, we can see the magnitude with which they rightfully taught and treated the presence of God. But it's very clear through this that there is a great separation between the people of God and the presence of God. There's two rooms, there's this curtain, this veil, and then only the holiest of holy men could go in there once a year and then would mediate on behalf of God to the people in all the regular workings of the system. This is all supposed to point to a giant chasm between God's presence and his people. That's the big idea. God's presence was among his people. He did not lie. He was, he was being true. He's like, I will dwell with you. You will be my people. I will be your God. But he is not accessible. He is not The Old Testament is filled with all of these people who tried to take shortcuts around this kind of a system and would would, would kind of disregard the holiness of God. And bad things happen to them, not because God is, is trite, but to show the magnitude and the weight of his holiness juxtaposed against the sinful nature of all humanity, even the sinful nature of his covenant people. There is a stark chasm here and that's what this is pointing to there are two rooms there is the system there's all this ritual that is all this work needs to be done to get to god but behind all this is the beating heart of the father that this is not the way it's supposed to be forever this is not the way it was supposed to be this is not the way god's people were created this is not the way it's supposed to be forever God is holy and just. He cannot dwell with, the, with a people who are in utter rebellion against him, but he desires this proximity, desires proximity. So something was set in place so that God could be with his people in this way. So sin ruined communion. Sin also created separation. The writer of Hebrews reiterates some of this, what I just said here, saying this, all of this that I just explained, is an illustration pointing to the present time. Now, the present time he's alluding to, that this author is writing after Jesus has resurrected and ascended back into heaven. So the new covenant has been brokered for God's people. Jesus has come and has fulfilled the law. Jesus has come and has died in the place for humanity. Jesus has come and has risen, conquering Satan's sin and death. And, Satan, and he has said to everyone who will listen, all who have authority, all who can hear what I'm saying, I have authority from heaven. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. So Jesus has come at the time of this writing. The author is building a point here. This illustration is pointing to the present time. And what does that mean? For the gifts and the sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleaning, cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So if you read that beginning part and you're like, this feels weird. Number one, we're on the other side of 
the resurrection, so it feels really weird. But it's set in, it was meant to be temporary. That's what the author is alluding to here. He's saying, hey, we're fully admitting that, that that's all great and that had its place and that had its time, but, but all of this stuff cannot actually cleanse a person's conscience. All of this stuff cannot actually heal the heart of a sinner. The old system was not enough. Listen, I'm, I'm a person who was raised loving the outdoors. Okay? I, from an early age, we would go on walks, we'd go on hikes, we'd ride our bikes. I, I love being outside. Okay? I, it's, I feel restored there. I feel closer to God when I'm outside. I love being outside. I like going camping. I love going backpacking. No stories today, I promise you. Uh, I, love, I love being outside. Okay? I don't love it as much as some people, though. On about day three or four of a camping trip, I'm like, okay, this is good for now. I really miss my bed. I'd like water that I don't have to walk for, but I can just go to my kitchen for. I'd like a bathroom that doesn't smell awful all of the time. I like, it's fine for now, but it's not a permanent solution. The old system, the author is fully alluding to here, is not enough. It was a placeholder for something to come. God wanted to be with his people, but because of sin, could not dwell fully and unrestrainedly with his people. They were good elements, to be sure. They all pointed, they were placeholders pointing to God. There was reverence, there was worship. It wasn't like it was a waste. It all had its place and its spot in the history of God's people, but it was not supposed to be the main thing forever. And on top of all of that, on top of this chasm that existed within God's people, there was also another sort of veil of sorts amongst people who don't know God yet. That's the effects of sin. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, put it this way. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, that's our enemy, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So sin has not only affected God's people and his ability to dwell with them, but those who are outside of God's covenant people, sin has also fractured their design so much. All of it, this is true of all of us before we came to Jesus, that, that Satan has veiled the eyes of their heart to not be able to see Jesus as glorious. Do you ever wonder why people are so hostile against God or so hostile against Jesus And the longer you're in church, maybe that becomes more confounding to you. But you have to remember that that they're not seeing God the way that you are. That's what the Bible says. And it's crazy for us to sit here in judgment of of people whose, whose eyes are veiled. When we see Jesus, we see beauty. When we see Jesus, we see forgiveness and grace. When we see Jesus, we see God as Father. Because the eyes of our heart have been opened by the gospel. Another type of veil has been lifted. And we can see things rightly. We have uh, an intricate system in our home right now for heat mitigation. Um, we, uh, we have blackout curtains. That, so our biggest windowed wall is like gets direct sunlight from like three to seven basically one so the hottest part of the day is just like our house is like bake me come on let's go like and it's it's so we have these blackout curtains that we've purchased and we have these this weird setup of air conditioning and fans and like the the portable units not central air and we we're, we're doing our best and it's and it's okay at best but i'm amazed how how effective these blackout curtains can be in blocking out light and blocking out heat. When the language of veil or curtain is used, it's, it's not just like this thin, like, lacy veil, perhaps that a bride would wear before a ceremony. The curtain that existed in the temple, tradition tells us, may have been three or four inches thick. 
we're talking like a thick veil. And so when this language is used, we have to think of like non-translucent, stopping warmth, stopping heat, stopping light types of veils. Sometimes with some people, the gospel can be explained perfectly and clearly, but because their hearts are veiled, they, they just can't see the beauty in it. That's why God has to do a work in their heart. Satan veils hearts to not see God, and on top of that, we have the chasm of the ritual. So God's intention to dwell with the people that he created, and there is all this veiling happening, both within God's people and outside of God's people. But something really interesting happens when Jesus comes. Because Jesus is supposed to be, in all expectation for his arrival, he's supposed to be like the fulfillment of all of this expectation. He's supposed to be the guy that that fits into this system and that everyone of the Jewish faith can look to as the hope as the king, as the warrior, as the one who is going to lead God's people out of their present horror and darkness and into everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus was supposed to fit in nicely like the last puzzle piece or like a capstone or something um, and to fulfill this whole thing. That's what everyone was looking for him to do. And what does he do instead? He fulfills the law for sure, he says, not one dot, not one piece of this law is going, to be, is going to go away, but I'm going to fulfill it perfectly. And what does he do? He, he rebukes people in leadership who are not living in light of what God has asked them to do. He rebukes people who have placed burdens on people that they can't bear. So God, Jesus is, is not just here to fulfill, he's here to shake things up. He says, the kingdom of God is at hand. It is advancing. I am here, and something new is happening right here and right now. And on the day that he was crucified, something happened in the temple. Something happened in the temple. That thick ceremonial curtain that was holding back the most holy place, when Jesus finally died, that curtain was torn in two, the Gospels tell us. There are also historical accounts that say that that happened as well, that are extra biblical. Jesus was not just coming to fulfill cosmic judgment, although that was part of it. He was coming to revitalize what was supposed to happen in the garden, which was God dwelling with his people. God was not just coming to fulfill ceremonial cleansing. Jesus came so that he might once and for all forgive and cleanse that people may dwell with God again. The harder veil was torn. God is revealed in full glory. This is what happens, happened when he died. And it goes on to explain what this means in the last bit of this passage here. It says, so Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. We don't no longer need a super holy man to go behind this curtain and to mediate on our behalf for God. We have Jesus now. Jesus went in and he becomes the high priest through which we commune with the Father. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. Jesus Jesus went to the heavenly places to do this work, not just in the structure and system that was established here in the dust and the dirt. It says, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. No longer was animal sacrifice needed. No longer was any sort of other ritual sacrifice needed. Jesus' sacrifice was the once and for all sacrifice to do away with the whole old system. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we may worship the living God. Jesus makes it possible for God to dwell with his people, not just from a judgment standpoint, but from a conscience standpoint. When your conscience is burdened by sin, when your conscience is burdened by regret, there is something in you because you were created to commune with God that does not want to go be with God. Because you know 
that you are not worthy. You know that you are broken. You know that you are sinful just like the rest of us. And instead of bringing a goat or a calf or ashes or some other ceremonial rite, Jesus says, none of that needs to happen anymore. Your consciences are cleared now through my blood. If your faith is in me, you received the clearest of conscience you ever could from any ceremonial cleansing. You get to go worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised for them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant. Amen. (laughs) This passage here, I'm going to close with this. You need three things that that Jesus provides with his presence and with his forgiveness. You were created to, to enjoy and to experience the presence of God. And what you need to know from this sermon this morning is that the gospel has made that possible. And the question that comes to you and I is, are we too distracted to live into it? Do you hear his voice this morning calling you into deeper communion? Because you need three things continually. Number one, you need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. Now, if your faith is in Jesus, you have been cleansed in this way described here. But you and I stumble. You and I fall. You and I make mistakes, say things we wish we had not done, do things we wish we could take back. And, and here's, here's where the world system breaks apart. The world will will do a lot, and indeed has some helpful resources, to equip you to forgive yourself, to equip you to see yourself in a new light. But here's, here's the way you were created, because you were not created to be a lone man or a lone woman who is dealing with the weight of your own sin and your own soul. You were created for relationship with God. So when you try to do that all yourself, it feels pretty good for a while, but all of a sudden the guilt and the shame and the hurt comes rushing back in because you need someone or something other than yourself to declare you forgiven. A judge, we have legal systems that exist for maybe the most public, grotesque sins that are discovered. Many are not. And oftentimes that system works great, Sometimes that system doesn't work truly in a truly just manner. So here's the thing. We need more than that. What about all of the little things in your heart? Maybe you've not actually broken a law or, or, or done something outwardly egregious, but maybe there's just this thing that you keep thinking about and you would give anything to take that thought away. Or you treat your, someone closest to you that you love so much and for some reason you just act the worst towards them. And you say things horrible to them and you, you don't give them the benefit of the doubt and you assume the worst. We need, we need forgiveness for those things because those are the things that built up, accumulated over time, will, will bear down our conscience and keep us away from the God who wants to commune with us. You need to know that those sins are forgiven as well as we bring them to God and confess them with others, as Joel talked about yesterday. You need someone or something other than yourself to declare you forgiven. And that is what Jesus offers us. You need forgiveness. You need a comforted conscience. You need a comforted conscience. You need someone or something other than yourself to offer you a clean slate. Listen, you can change jobs. You can move town. You can reinvent yourself. But as the Abbott brothers said famously, lies don't need an aeroplane to follow you wherever you're going. You go wherever you go. You can change your life, you can change your number, you can change yourself, but you can't clear your own conscience. Not really, anyway. What God offers in the gospel is not just access to the Father through Jesus, through the doing away, or the fulfillment, rather, of all of this ceremonial rite. He clears your conscience truly so that you may approach boldly like a father and a son. A good father 
not, doesn't just guide their children, but, but helps to clear their conscience of the little fears and worries and insecurities that they have as they grow. And as they grow, they get bigger and more like the real world. But a good father puts things in perspective. A good father tells the truth. A good father helps a son or daughter see themselves rightly and see the situation rightly. And what God offers in Christ is a clean conscience for you. That despite what you've done, despite who you've been, despite what's weighing you down, that if your faith is in Jesus, you are united with him. And the way that God looks at you is the way he looks at Jesus. And you've been given access to to the Father to receive from him all the days of your life. You need forgiveness, you need a comforted conscience, and lastly, you need a living God. You need a living God. What a passage like this in Hebrews does is it reminds us that we serve a living God. If you hold God at a distance because you think he's perpetually upset with you, or if you hold God at a distance because you think your sin is too great for him to want to be with you, or if you hold God at a distance because your own burdened conscience is keeping you from doing the things that, that help you commune with God, then God will seem over time more and more distant and dead to you. What a passage like this does is shows that for us, speaking into the present time, today, for you, in 2024, that you serve a living God who desired to commune with his people then, and in Jesus, you are a part of his people now, his covenant people, and he desires to commune with you. He desires to walk with you. He desires to be with you. He desires to, for you to experience his truth and his love day by day. It's what you were created for. It's, it's, it's why everything feels so lonely and isolated. You were created for this communion. You need someone or something other than yourself to declare that you are worthy of love. You can love yourself all you want, and that's not inherently a bad thing. But you need someone else outside of you to declare over you that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are beloved, that you are loved, that you are received, that you are not your mistakes, that you are worthy of love. So here's all I want to say in closing. The title of this sermon is Lifting and Tearing of Veils. I want you to consider That in Jesus, the veils over your heart have been lifted to see God rightly. The veil long ago separating the most holy place from God's people has been torn in two. And so here's what's before you and me every day. God in Jesus Christ has done everything he can to get as close to you as he can. He has done his part. He has not remained distant. He has not kept himself at bay. He has not remained a mystery. He has extended himself to every believer as much as he possibly can in the gospel. The veil is torn. The spirit is within you. God is here. The question that comes to you and I is what do we do with that? How do we live? How do we walk? What do we secretly entertain? What's our priority? How do we structure our lives? How do we commune with this God who gave his son to be with us once and for all? How do we walk as men and women in light of the presence of God? If we're going to talk about following Jesus, we have to talk about a living God. And we have to talk about a Jesus who went and into the places we never could into the spots we never could, to do what we never could so that we may be brought back to the Father. When we use that language, this is what we're talking about. The veil is torn, the veil is lifted. Heed his call today to be with him. The band can come on up. Let's pray.
Father, I pray that you would give us this morning a healthy view of yourself. That we would be able to see yourself truly and, li- and rightly because of what Jesus has done. I pray this morning as we respond in worship that every man, woman, and child in here would, would see you, would see you truly, would see you holy, and would commune with you in the way you've always intended. God, show us what that looks like. Show us what it looks like to pursue you, to walk with you, to commune with you, and to follow you wherever you're leading us. Be with us now as we respond in song and in prayer and through communion. Amen.